All right, resumed recording. Um, let's see, so I'm Robert Villa. I'm president of Tucson Herpetological Society. Um, I come to you from the Desert Laboratory on Tuamak Hill in Tucson, Arizona, the homeland of the Aatam, Yaqui, and Hopi and their ancestors. Um, Tumamak is named after the Aata word for horned lizard, Jemamag. Um, and across from Tumamak Hill, looking north, we have Babadoag, or Toad Mountain, known to the Aata. Um, if you would like to see our previous presentations, you can search for Tucson Herpetological Society at youtube.com. And uh, we have two of our previous uh, presentations there. Um, we don't quite know yet who our next speaker will be in March, um, but you will know as soon as we do. Um, we have a, um, well, in November, I do know that we are anticipating Harry Green to speak um, on the relationship between primates and snakes. Uh, again, um, you all are muted. So if you have a question or an announcement, go ahead and click on the chat function in Zoom and post questions or announcements there. And I'll do my best to moderate. All right. So some announcements are um, that there's some there's two new books out, Snakes of Arizona and the Mojave Rattlesnake. These were written by two THS members and, and friends of ours. Um, they're ready to be ordered and shipped if you would like a copy. Snakes of Arizona is a really huge deal. It's a it's a monumental work and um, it's very affordable at least right now in the first printing um, and after the first printing the second printing will be much more expensive so um, be sure and order your copy um, the other book is the mojave rattlesnake and how it became an urban legend and it is everything you ever wanted to know about Mojave rattlesnakes. And um, it's written by uh, Mike Cardwell, who lives here in Tucson. And he is he has dedicated his life to studying uh, this species of rattlesnake. The next item is uh, these two upcoming meetings, the 46th Annual Desert Tortoise Council Symposium will be virtual. And it'll be Tuesday and Thursday mornings between February 9th and 25th. Um, please register, support tortoise conservation. Um, if you become a member or renew your membership, you'll get a discount on symposium registration. The other meeting is February 11th, or February 11th to 13th, and it's the Southwestern Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation uh, Networking Extravaganza. Um, the first day will be a series of talks, mostly about bullfrogs uh, and invasive species. And then I think the next day will be a series of rapid fire five minute talks, uh, networking as it were. Um, there's also the um, federal status of the Sonoran desert tortoise populations. Um, right now is I don't think is a uh, public comment period, but um, they have solicited scientific information about uh, uh, the Sonoran Desert Tortoise for considering its federal status. And we'll of course let you know when the general public can make comments and write letters. So um, we get to our speakers and um, announce, present them. Tonight, we have the pleasure of welcome, welcoming Miguel Grajeda and Michael Bogan, who 
who will present on their monitoring of Sonoita mud turtles in the Sonoita River, Mexico's driest river. Miguel is a graduate student pursuing a doctorate in natural resources at the University of Arizona, studying the impact of human development on the populations of two endangered species that inhabit the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve in Sonora, Mexico, the Sonoita mud turtle and the Sonoran pronghorn. He was born in Mexico City and lived most of his early years in the state of San Luis Potosí in central Mexico. He obtained a master's degree in wildlife management at Sul Ras and a degree in animal science at the Universidad Autónoma Agraria Antonio Narro in Coahuila, Mexico. Since 2015, he's worked at the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve as coordinator of the National Resources Management Area and also worked for several years as part of the NGO Protección de la Fauna Mexicana in efforts to protect threatened species and developing management studies for protected areas in the Chihuahuan Desert and the Sierra Madre Oriental. He's been involved in projects with the Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, Grupo de Ecología y Conservación de Islas, Island Ecology and Conservation Group, and Comisión Nacional de Áreas Naturales Protegidas, CONAMP. Miguel is also a passionate conservation photographer. You should visit his website. Uh, he spends most of his time documenting the rich diversity of ecosystems in Northern Mexico and the situations that affect their integrity. And Michael Bogan, is a freshwater ecologist and an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment at the University of Arizona. He studies the impact of droughts, floods, and anthropogenic water use on aquatic species and biodiversity in streams and springs across the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. He has been working in the region as an ecologist since 2000. He earned his master's and doctoral degrees at Oregon State and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, before starting his current position at the University of Arizona in 2016. I also happen to know that they're really great guys, and it's a pleasure to have them. Um, and with that, I'll stop screen sharing and hand it over to Michael. Excellent. Thank you, Beto. Um, we are hoping, especially after that wonderful introduction, that Miguel will join us. <laughs> he just got back from Mexico uh, and he's quarantining at home where his, his internet is not always reliable. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to hear from Miguel. Luckily, we had already split up this talk into halves and um, I have the first half. So we will begin and hopefully you'll get to hear Miguel in the second half. Um, Thanks everyone for attending. This is a, a species that is uh, close to both Miguel's and Mai's heart, um, and also one that was you know, really important to Phil Rosen. Um, so we're a lot of what we're doing is kind of picking up the, the charge for the species, especially in Mexico, um, and, and are thankful for Phil and all the work that he did over the years to try to bring attention to the species. Um, we're going to start here. So I wanted to first acknowledge um, both the Yacharatam and the Tanoatam. Uh, their ancestral lands are where the Sonoida mud turtle lives, um, and they were fantastic stewards of that land um, until they lost it in, in colonization. And, and since then, as we'll see, the turtle has not been doing as well. Um, and Miguel and I have gotten uh, uh, funding from a, a variety of sources from the Park Service. Uh, uh, Chelonian Research Fund. Uh, Miguel's funded on a Conacit Fellowship. He, uh, as Beto mentioned, he had worked uh, for the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve for a while, and now he uh, is a grad student at U of A. Um, and Conacit funds his fellowship. Um, Turtle Survival Alliance, lots of folks have uh, contributed funding, so we're grateful to that. And then, you know, as I mentioned, we're kind of picking up the the banner for the mud turtles, but there are a lot of people who've been working for years and years on the mud turtle, including uh, folks at Organ Pipe like Peter Holm, uh, Charles Connor, Amy Pate. Um, so we're, we're grateful to all those who, who came before us and, and are still helping to save the mud turtle on uh, one side of the border or the other. 
So tonight we're going to um, give you an introduction first to the Rio Sonoita Basin itself, in case you are not that familiar with it. It's a, a fairly remote river basin um, and talk about the, the species that are endemic to that area. Um, and then I'll get into the current status, which I know a lot of folks are interested in hearing the current status of the, the different populations of Sonoita mud turtle and some of the preliminary genetic uh, analyses that we've done to try to understand how best to manage those populations. Um, and then Miguel will talk a lot about the work he's been doing both uh, when he was an employee of the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve and as a graduate student. Um, studying, doing mark recapture studies and movement studies to try to figure out um, how these turtles get around on the landscape and, and whether they can, can do any bit of rescuing themselves when their populations get in trouble. And then at the end, we'll talk about some interesting um, new opportunities for conservation. Um, those of you who are in Tucson may know that we have a lot of effluent flowing in our river here in Tucson. Um, and that is not unique to Tucson. So uh, effluent may be the future of the Sonoida mud turtle. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I wanted to start out with a, a sky eye view of the Rio Sonoita Basin. So the, the headwaters of the Rio Sonoita Basin actually go all the way to Babo Kivari Peak on the west end of the Tonawata Nation, the, the main part of the nation. Um, a lot of those washes that you drive across when you're going across Highway 86 all drain into the Rio Sonoita. Um, and then eventually it comes through here, the part that we'll talk about tonight, and then heads south where it hits the Pinacate Volcanic Shield and drains out near Puerto Penasco. Um, of course, most of the time there's not water in 98% uh, of that channel. Um, and the perennial portions of the river are just right here that we'll focus on tonight. Other than that, there's really just uh, seasonal tinajas that dry up uh, each year. And then a, a smattering of freshwater springs, especially right along the Gulf here. Um, and then Kitovac Springs, which is a little bit outside the basin, but will be relevant tonight. So the, the hydrologic landscape is pretty dry in the Sonoita Basin to say the least. So if we, zoom in, we're going to look at this area in particular, uh, which is the perennial portions of the Rio Sonoita and Quito, Quito Vaquito Springs in Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, which um, probably everybody is, is familiar with, because that's really where we saw um, endemic species and where the, the heart of the aquatic species distribution is at. Let's see here. Um, I'm, I'm used to teaching, so I'm monitoring the chat to see if students have questions. <laughs> so feel free to toss in a question as, as we go and I'll try to answer them as I can. Um, so if we think about what the, the Rio Sonoita was historically and um, all the way up through the early 1900s, um, it, it was never a very large river system, um, but there were three perennial reaches uh, as this map shows from, from one of Phil Rosen's publications. Uh, there is a Cienega and a perennial reach where there's the modern day town of Sonoita, uh, another perennial reach downstream at Santo Domingo, and then another perennial reach, Agua Dulce, that we'll talk about a lot tonight, uh, which is right across the border from Quito Baquito Springs. Beyond that, it was all either intermittent or ephemeral channels. Um, this is a picture of the Rio Sonoita in the town of Sonoita. If you drive to Rocky Point now or Puerto Penasco, uh, you'll cross a bridge, and if you were to look left from that bridge as you're heading south, that's basically the area you're looking at in this photo. Um, so in 1908, it was, it was certainly a lot different looking. There was perennial flows, there were willow trees, um, and these kind of met right side by side with the, the Sonoran Desert here. Um, there's a written description from 1853 or so, one of the border surveys uh, that talks about numerous deep charcos or pools uh, in even small lagoons in its lower part. Cienega is blessed with a small stream fed at its outset by a number of small springs. The little river of Sonoita continues but about a mile as a running stream. So that's talking about the reach there in the town of Sonoita. Um, so not a lot of water, but uh, reliable water, which is really important in this dry Western part of the Sonoran desert. Um, even though there wasn't very much water at all, uh, there's still some uh, impressive endemism there because it was so isolated from any other water body. Um, it might have had 
connection with the Colorado River more than a million years ago before a lot of the Pinacate volcanic field started. Um, so the species that are there have been there and isolated for quite a while. So those species include the star of tonight's show, the Sonoida mud turtle, um, also an endemic uh, pupfish, the Sonoida pupfish, um, and then the Sonoida longfin dace. And the pupfish and the mud turtle are still in the river and still in the wild um, in both the US and in Mexico. But the Sonoida longfin dace is actually extirpated from the wild. Um, it probably needed a lot more flow than these other two species. And so it disappeared about 2008 uh, from the river. There's a small population, uh, Dennis Caldwell and others will know it well, uh, that, was, that was rescued. And uh, there's a small population in a pond at Sado down in Puerto Penasco, uh, but it doesn't occur in the wild anymore. Um, so here's the star of tonight's show, the Sonoida mud turtle. Uh, it was listed under the Mexican Endangered Species Act, the Nome 59. Um, in 2010, and then the IUCN red list in 2016, and then in 2017, as a lot of folks will know in the room, uh, it was listed under the Endangered Species Act in the United States as well. So it's a, it's a subspecies with a lot of conservation concern. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of walk you through the current status of the populations. Um, this is one that uh, uh, there's been a lot of changes in recent decades and a lot of changes even in the last couple of years. Um, and then tell you about some of the preliminary genetic patterns, um, some quick analyses we did um, when we were really getting panicked and wondering if we can move and mix uh, some of these subpopulations of the Sonoida mud turtle. And I see a question about Kitabakito on the wall and we will definitely get to there in a minute. Um, so these are the historic populations of the mud turtles. Uh, the natural populations were Quito Baquito on the U.S. side, Agua Dulce in the Rio, Santo Domingo, and uh, what they call the Xochimilco Reach, which is here in the town of Sonoita. In addition to those four natural populations, uh, there's an introduced population at Quitovac, uh, which is technically outside the basin. Um, we don't know that history for sure, but it's assumed to be have been introduced there. Um, and then in the town of Sonoida, in kind of recent years, there's been a population at uh, the Sewage Lagoon. And so we'll talk about that one tonight. And that probably colonized on its own from the riverbed from Xochimilco and established a good population in the lagoon. So to so just walk you through these, these five populations and give you kind of where they're at, um, the Kitabakito population is, is very well studied and very well protected in Oregon Pipe. Um, there's between 100 and 150 turtles and that population has been stable uh, over time. So we're not um, too concerned in the long term about that. However, as folks know uh, from recent news events, there's been a lot going on at Quito Baquito. Uh, one concern is long-term and chronic, and that is a decrease in flow volume of the springs that feed uh, the pond that you see in the photograph here. And so that's been ongoing really since the, the you know, late 80s um, and it has continued. Um, that's most likely due to regional groundwater use, agricultural development on the Mexico side of the border, uh, municipal water development there. Um, and so flows have been declining and that's been a concern uh, for the, the long-term persistence of the turtles there. It hit a critical mark this summer where flow dropped to about six gallons per minute, um, which was the lowest that it had ever been. And this coincided with the border wall construction. Um, so there was a lot of concern about the influence of the border wall on um, those groundwater levels there. The, the short answer is we don't know if there is uh, any immediate impact of the, the groundwater pumping for the border wall. Um, it's likely that groundwater moves more slowly and it wasn't having an impact yet. Um, but there were a lot of other things going on at Quito Baquito this summer, including um, uh, record heat, uh, no rainfall, a failed monsoon season. Um, and then part of it, uh, the issues there might have been the, the truck traffic of the construction traffic as well. Um, there's a, a pond liner in Quito Baquito. And so there could have been vibration that produced some cracks in that pond liner. 
So there's there's a lot of work right now, but the Park Service is on top of it. Um, they're looking at relining the pond, uh, stabilizing Quito Baquito, and and making sure that there'll be habitat there even if the the spring levels um, decline a little bit further. Um, there was a question if if anyone saw any uh, direct mortality of turtles from the wall. There there haven't been any documented um, to date, but um, that's definitely something to keep an eye out for. Then across the, the border from Quito Baquito is the Agua Dulce Reach, and this is within the Pinacate Biosphere Reserve. Um, so it has a, a level of protection, although it is um, used as an ajito and managed as an ajito, a communal property. And so there's a lot of grazing and, and other impacts in there. Um, this is Miguel in the, the Agua Dulce Reach, and you can see that um, it obviously goes through some cycles of flooding and drought and the population at this location certainly respond to that. Um, and it's also gone through some recent changes. Uh, Phil Rosen's early studies there from you know, the 90s and even late 80s through, through the mid 2000s, um, this reach was perennially flowing. And so you can see here in the photo, it wasn't a deep river, but it was flowing year round. Um, and that ceased about 2009 or 2010. And now we get into the situation where I think it was 20, early 2018 uh, was the most critical time we saw in this reach where it was down to only 10 small pools. And that was all the perennial water that was left. Um, obviously, the, the turtles could crawl out of the water and, and estivate for a while on dry land. But uh, those 10 small pools were all that was keeping the pupfish going at Agua Dulce. Um, so there's some certainly some some issues here in the long term to think about. And Miguel, hopefully he'll be able to tell you about it or I'll try to tell you about it. Um, our population estimates here vary pretty widely because of that dynamic cycles of flood and drought. Um, so depending on which year and which data set we use, there's somewhere between 25 and 250 turtles in this reach. Um, the next historic population was Santo Domingo, uh, which is a little bit upstream, a few miles upstream from here. And as you can see in this Google Earth image, there is really nothing left of the river in Santo Domingo. Um, it was documented as being perennial from 1850 through about 1980. Uh, but in recent decades, the, the flow has turned to ephemeral. Um, this was even the case when Phil Rosen was working out there. Um, he did manage to find a single turtle in one of these pools that holds water a little bit longer um, in 2001. But what we probably saw there was the end of, of a long established population um, as, as that water lasted uh, for less and less time each year, those turtles would become more and more starved and unhappy. Um, so we're guessing this is an extirpated population. Um, there are some uh, narcotraficante issues in there right now. There's some people that you don't want to visit with. Um, so we haven't been able to get in there on our last couple visits uh, to, to check it out. So we're hoping that, that that situation will change and we can get in there and, and confirm that these turtles are, are in fact gone. Then we've got the historic perennial reach in the town of Sonoita. Um, the Xochimilco Reach. Uh, this was where the, the Cienega was. This is why the town is where it is. Um, the, the perennial flow in the river ended uh, probably by the 80s, but there was a military base immediately adjacent to the, um, I see Miguel entering our meeting, good. Um, there was a military base immediately adjacent to this reach and the military base had some sewage runoff that kept the river perennial in the spot in town. Um, so when Phil was studying it 20 years ago, you can see the photo down here, this area of Xochimilco was uh, filled with water. Um, that has since dried up, that military base has closed down. And so by the time we started visiting regularly about four years ago, um, Xochimilco became intermittent and only had water during the monsoon season. However, when it does fill and these pools have water for a few months, uh, we do see occasional turtles in there. Um, so they are hanging on. Um, and as of a couple months ago, somebody in uh, the nearby neighborhood has started discharging uh, sewage into the reach again, which, you know, in a normal situation, we would be uh, uh, sad to see sewage in a river. But in this situation, we're actually happy because it brings perennial water back to the system. Um, so historically, Phil documented about 
345 turtles there. Um, we know that they are still there, but we don't know how, how big that population is. Um, it probably shrank quite a bit in the years that it was uh, intermittent flow. And then finally, uh, we've got that sewage lagoon in Sonoita. This was the man-made habitat that turtles had colonized. Um, and Phil Rosen really thought that this was kind of the stronghold of the species. There were at least 300 turtles there. He thought as many as, as 400 turtles. Um, it was really a, a turtle paradise um, until summer of 2019. And this is a, a drone shot that Miguel took that summer. Um, we went out there to kind of check on, see what the, the situation looked like. And uh, we're very unhappy to see that the large lagoon had shrunk down to this small amount of water here. Um, and, and Miguel documented um, some turtles that had died um, due to the heat and drought at that point in time. Um, he managed to rescue 11 of the turtles. And we'll talk about those uh, towards the end of the talk uh, before this pond dried up. About 10 years prior, um, a bunch of folks from the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Phil and others had worked with the Municipal Water Agency, UMAPAS. And uh, as they were planning a new sewage lagoon, they had agreed to um, salvage the turtles from this lagoon and build a habitat for them in the new sewage lagoon. Um, and then 10 years went by and they uh, either either accidentally or purposely forgot about that and were not interested in uh, helping us rescue turtles from the lagoon. Um, so this really went from about 300 turtles down to near extirpation. Now drying alone wouldn't have been the worst thing in the world, um, but you'll notice on the edge of this, after the lagoon dried up, someone uh, decided to light a fire in the dry vegetation and so the entire wetland vegetation around the edges of the lagoon and along the sides burned. And that's where Miguel discovered that most of the turtles had gone to hide when the pond dried up. Um, so unfortunately, we found over 140 uh, turtles that had tried to uh, estivate uh, in that wetland vegetation and were burned directly by the fire. So this population is pretty near to extirpation. Um, there's one tiny little pocket of water left that you'll see in the image that pops up here. And that is the original primary sewage pond uh, before it would spill into a secondary pond. So we haven't gotten quite the right uh, hazmat suits yet to go in and look for turtles there, but that's certainly in the plan to see if we can uh, rescue a few more turtles from this last little bit of that original sewage lagoon. So the new sewage lagoon you can see here is about uh, two and a half kilometers away. So this is the old one that was drying up. This is the new one here. Um, they did not build a turtle habitat for this new lagoon. It is a very large, uh, steep walled black plastic covered um, wasteland. <laughs> and so there is not turtle habitat there. However, in October of 2019, Miguel and I went out there and we noticed that they actually ran a pipe here to this arroyo and started dumping this uh, sewage after it went to the second lagoon into the arroyo and that flowed down to the river and is now supporting about uh, a mile and a half of flow in the Rio Sonoita. That's this um, kind of probably close to secondary treated wastewater. So maybe similar to what the Santa Cruz River was like before 2013. Um, so that will come into the story at the end of this presentation as a, as a potential boon for the turtles. Um, and then finally, we haven't been out to Kitovac in the last few years, uh, but there are reports that the turtles are still there. So this was uh, assumed by uh, Phil when he was out there to have about 200 turtles. Um, and we hope that there's um, at least that number still remaining at the site, but that's what's on the list of places to get back to. So with all this um, kind of panic over crashing populations, uh, we wanted to do some quick genetic analyses. Uh, Phil and others had worked on a, a mitochondrial DNA analysis uh, to see how distinct the Sonoida was from the Sonora mud turtle. Um, but we were really interested in these subpopulations here and whether or not we could move turtles from one place to another without messing up uh, their genetics. And so we, got uh, a little bit of tissue and ran some quick analyses with a, a slightly more modern approach, microsatellite approach uh, with eight loci. 
and we had uh, turtles from the Agua Dulce Reach, turtles from Quito Baquito, and then turtles from the Sewage Lagoon to see what their genetics look like. Um, so this is the only uh, numbers you'll see in my part of the talk. Uh, this is a, a number FST that just talks about how distinct the populations are from one another. Um, and so first I'll highlight that the biggest difference, the highest FST number was seen between Quito Baquito and the Sewage Lagoon. So that makes sense because they're the furthest away from one another. Um, the interesting part is the smallest genetic difference was between the Sewage Lagoon and the Agua Dulce reach of the river. And now these are about 18 kilometers apart. Um, so that's telling us that there's some, some serious connectivity along the river, even though that's a, a much longer distance than mud turtles usually move. And then interestingly, almost as large as the difference between Quito and the Sewage Lagoon is the difference between Quito and Agua Dulce, even though those are only a kilometer or so apart. So it's evidently easier for turtles to move up and down the Rio, even long distances, than it is to move from Quito Baquito a kilometer to get to Agua Dulce. The good news is that um, FST values greater than 0.15 are what we would consider distinct subpopulations for management. Um, so we don't have to worry about preserving the genetic integrity of one of these individual subpopulations. So these preliminary analyses suggest we could actually take turtles from Quito and relocate them anywhere in the Rio Sonoita um, if we needed to do that to augment populations. Um, and we're going to continue some of these analyses to bolster our sample size uh, with some older samples from, from Phil Rosen. So now, Miguel, hopefully you're here and can join us. And I will turn over the second half of the talk to him. Hi, thank you, Michael. We'll make sure, are you able to um, share your screen? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm going to continue uh, in the second part, talking about the effort or capture and recapture and some uh, telemetry that we have been doing with this, uh, with some of this part of the population. So this right here is uh, an image of the Agua Dulce site. Which, uh, has, as you can see, this area is very uh, shallow. Uh, when the turtles are around, it's very easy to find them. It's easy for us, for predators, it's even easier. So they, 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 when they are active, they get very vulnerable. This is the same area, but when the river is, is having less, you can see how uh, from a distance you can find the turtles just walking around the water. So for this effort, we started in, two, in the year 2016, uh, visiting the river. The, that, that year we started uh, just as an experiment. We did it only once and see if, if it worked. And that year, that was the base of our to keep doing it at least uh, once uh, or twice every, uh, every one or two months. So we started marking the individuals that we were finding uh, utilizing this, this uh, method, marking the, the margin of the, of, of the shell. It's a very common way to do it. And it's very easy to, to mark and, and to be able to identify uh, those individuals in the future. So we have been doing it since, since that. And, but in the last two years, 2019 and 2020, we, we had more visits to the, the Agua Dulce site and looking for more 
individuals marked. Another thing that we we do is uh, we take pictures of both sides, the the upper part of the shell and the and the the front part is called the plastron, and we do that because sometimes if for some reason we we cannot identify that uh, individual, we can also use the plastron to compare photographs and also identify individuals as a, a, a as a print mark. So we have been able to uh, separate individuals just by looking at the plastron. And we have a whole catalog uh, with these pictures. And also we keep record of each individual that we, we have been finding uh, in this part. You can see how the Agua Dulce Ridge is, is probably no more, no longer than two kilometers. Uh, one mile, and most of the turtles are just in this in this part. You can see every one of the records that we had for years, and you can see how they pretty much just stay in in that section of the river. Sometimes, if if there is enough water, they can move a little farther out, but they us they are usually just in that section. Uh, this map looks upside down, but what, are, what you are seeing is this part of the this section is going northwest. Uh, what you see in the in, in the uh, in the down part of the of the, of the image is uh, up up river and it's flowing up and and to the left. So this is uh, with all the individuals that we have been finding. Uh, each individual that has a, a yellow line is captured. So some we, we have been recapturing just a few, a few of them, just 35 out of 139 individuals. So we still have to find, and we haven't got to the point where we are finding more recaptures than, than new individuals. So that means that we, we, we still have the chance to, to find more and to estimate more uh, individuals in that population. The red points you can see in the year 2019 are individuals that were found dead uh, and that were previously uh, marked. So you can see how in 2019 we had a lot of uh, dead turtles. So I, I will talk a, a little bit about that in, in a minute. So this graph is very uh, explicative by itself. And hopefully, if we keep doing this for one, two, or three more years, it is going to be more clear and showing us. Uh, in a better way, how uh, recaptures are uh, uh, a fundamental part for to estimate the, the the whole population size. Here, um, I just have a an, um, a table showing how we have thirty five individuals that have been have been recaptured. 24, 24 of them have been recaptured two times, nine of them three times, and two of them four times. And how um, 18 and 2020, with the, we, we attended this, this site uh, two, nine times, and in 2020, 12, so we we increased our effort looking for them and and we didn't find that many. So why uh, we didn't find that many turtles in the last two years? Uh, this is a table of the number of of times that we visited each year. 2016 only once in March 
2007, first part of the of the year from February to this last year, 2020, we tried to go out almost every year. We, we couldn't go it from pandemic. It was uh, challenging uh, to go out to the field, but once in summer we, we tried to go again, but we didn't find shuttles. And um, in my ex experience is that um, during those months, the, the river didn't have enough water. So basically what I was seeing is that the turtles were hidden under, uh, under branches, underground. And I, I didn't find any turtle being active in those months. And I, I also know, know that because we had some turtles with transmitters and they weren't active, we, they were all hidden. And it wasn't until October when the, we had some water again and the river started flowing again when activity. And in previous years, in 2019, we had, and we had more months with flow in the river and we had more activity during the 2019. That's something that is going to affect our uh, detectability of these individuals. Uh, uh, a continuous flow through the year, so more activity, and in, in a year, it's going to be harder to find active individuals. And that's also going to uh, uh, for final result. Uh, it, it's not that we have less turtles that year, it means that we just couldn't find them. So it's, that's why it's important to keep track of them through and don't, not, don't, don't take decisions based on three or four years, but in, in a close five or ten years and see if there is a, a trend on the um, uh, uh, dynamic of the population. So uh, here I, I show you the number of captured individuals that I have per year. In 2016, I went only once and I, I found 10 individuals. It's a really good year. Uh, I, I went only six times and I found almost 70 individuals. I remember finding uh, more than 20 individuals in, in when Michael was there with us. And that was very uh, amazing to see, to find uh, in one, uh, 20 individuals. That was fantastic. And in these last two years, we didn't find that many. Um, so we, we need to keep doing it for one or two two more years and see if there is actually a difference and see if we had an actual reduction in the population size or it's just uh, a matter of um, the habitat availability is uh, affecting our detectability. So just in uh, uh, an estimate on the data that we have, we have that for 2017, we had an estimation of more uh, than 100. Uh, for 2019, we found less individuals. We had about 100. But then uh, in 2019, we had, uh, I was telling you that we had uh, nine individuals that were found dead. And then we didn't have, find that many turtles in the river. So the estimation is 2025 individuals and for 20, 2020 it increased just a little bit with a great margin of error i guess that was it <laughs> <laughs> we lost miguel let's we'll see if he rejoins if not in the meantime i will Jump in with his slides. Let's see here. I wasn't quite ready to jump this fast. 
maybe Miguel could just join us with his voice too. That might be better. Okay. Okay. Can folks uh, see the graph where Miguel was at? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I was answering a question, so I can't pick up exactly where Miguel left, left off. Uh, but talking about the, the estimated abundances, how they've been decreasing through time. Um, and a lot of that was due to um, a pretty strong mortality year that we saw in 2019. Um, you know, before that, Miguel had only found one dead uh, turtle in the reach. And in 2019, we found 13 uh, and very few live turtles, which was concerning. Um, and this was the year that there was the most water in the river that had been there for a decade. So it was a little bit counterintuitive, um, but there was a, a hurricane that came in and I see Miguel back. <laughs> Miguel, do you want to pick up where you left off? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, continuing. Uh, sure, let's see. We we're just talking about uh, how the Hurricane in in twenty nine and late twenty eighteen allowed the uh, raccoons to colonize. Yeah, and, and that was uh, interesting. Uh, have records of raccoons uh, in the in, in recent years for that area, and suddenly we started having raccoons everywhere. And we put a camera trap start having records of, of area, uh, especially for 2019. And we kept the camera trap for 2020 and we didn't have that many records. So we are thinking that the responsible for that uh, high mortality in, tw in 2019 were the, the raccoons that moved from somewhere else to that area and start uh, predating the, the turtles that weren't used to, to those predators. And probably that's why we had in, increase in the mortality of the turtles. And then for for this past year, we didn't see, fortunately, we didn't see that. Uh, and hopefully uh, we won't have that this year where we'll see what happens, especially with this uh, rains, right? So in prints in along the river, we saw these these dead turtles, and we were asking people around see if 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 they were to identify who was responsible for this. Uh, we usually found the turtles without the 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 legs. Uh, without the head, or sometimes the, the head was... So that, that was uh, very unique, something that uh, uh, a specific predator will do. And um, many biologists uh, thought that it was a, a, a raccoon. So that's why we, we, we put the camera traps and yep, there, there they are. The raccoons using the the we have the 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 sonorita turtles. Okay, for so in 2017, uh, is for using telemetry to see to to track uh, specific individuals and uh, through the year. Or at least so that's that's what, uh, the period in, in this um, um, radio. So we start putting this transmitter the river and and looking for them. Manually, uh, we we, we could tell us that we we had marked and and with the transmitter. So usually we, and then the next time when we were there, we couldn't see it, but we were able to, to find it and see where we were, what they were doing. And usually they were 
under the, the branches or under underground. So we rarely saw him again uh, physically. So that explains a lot of why we are not having that many individuals uh, detected because usually they are most part of the time under underwater, under uh, branches, uh, in the shelter or underground. And here's an example of uh, one of the turtles with the trans uh, swimming around in the, in the river. So for 2017, we had only five individuals with transmitters in different parts of the river. And we were curious to see uh, in, in, in this, in, in this, this time, the, and they didn't move that far. As you can see, every color is a different look. You can see that how they didn't move that far. Probably the one that moved farther was uh, the yellow one, which moved probably 100 meters away from the place where we, we found it the first time. So they usually stay in, in the same area. If they don't have the need, they, they will wear. If, if there is not enough water, they, they may choose just to, to, to hide on, on the ground. This is a more recent effort. This is from last year, 2020, from January to October. And different symbols are different individuals. And you can see how also they, they stay in, in the same area. I'm going to show you one by one. This is um, the turtle number one. It usually stayed in, in the same area, but we have one day when it, it moved uh, almost like a kilometer away. This is the only individual we had with that kind of movement. But the rest of them, this one is turtle number two. He just moved 24 meters from the place where we found it the first time. Turtle number three, it moved uh, 70 meters in 2020. Um, we had the same individual marked and it just moved 79 meters. So they usually stay in the same place. They do move this one 72 meters, this other one, uh, 16 meters, for number six, 48 meters. And for the year 70, uh, 2017 to, to 2020, it moved 154 meters. This, this one is not, uh, we didn't get it, this information based on telemetry, but with recaptures, where, where we found it the first time and where we found it in 2020. That's, that's why it's also important to keep uh, the marks. This one is uh, total number seven. This one, 248 meters. So yeah, we, we, we found that they, they don't move. They just stay in the same reach where they can find uh, usual, usual habitat and water. So I'm gonna show you this, this series of pictures where uh, here you can see how the, the, when it has water, it has a continuous flow. This is right after the, the rain. I marked how the flow goes right here. In, it, it was for August 30th and this was just 20 days before, in August 20, uh, before the rain. And it, you can hardly, uh, the areas covered with water, these are blue polygons. So it, it has almost no water at all. How tendons make a lot of, of, uh, of difference. Uh, so, in those days during the dry season, the turtles are just in, in those in those pools where uh, 
where the water is. And once the, the start flowing again, they, they become more active and they start moving around. This is the same polygon without the satellite image. And this is the same uh, polygon of the river without water, just a few pools here and there. So for the future, uh, there are many opportunities for concert. We have many things to do. Um, case, um, we, uh, I'm showing you the, the old um, Sewage Lagoon that was in near Sonoita and the new one. And the, the blue line is the, the river. The, well, this is the, the canal that is connecting the sewage lagoon to the back to the Aguadulce Ridge, no, to the, the Rio Sonoita. Uh, we released the, the, the turtles that were, that were uh, captured in the, in the old sewage lagoon. So we, we have a small population of only nine individuals, a small group, uh, but we were able to put uh, telemetry radios. Uh, in this, uh, this was uh, here's uh, the nine cars that we released, and here we were able to release them. Uh, we we had all the permits. It wasn't just a, a random effort. We 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 had to do paperwork. We had to get the permits to be able to to get the turtles and put the, the transmitters and and put them back in in their habitat. So here we are releasing them. Very emotive. Uh, moment when we are releasing the, the turtles back in their habitat. And this is uh, a week later when we visited the, the same site. Uh, we, I was able to find one of the turtles that we released them uh, moving around, uh, exploring the area and being very active. So, I think we still have to name it. Uh, we just call it the new site in the Sonoita River. Uh, in the green green spot is the place where we released this uh, small group of turtles. And a week later, we found them already active in the, in the river. And one of them already moved in, in the canal that is connecting to the Sewage Lagoon. Uh, far away from, from, it was probably uh, 200 meters away from the release site. So we're going to turtles for the next six months, uh, finding them with the telemetry. So um, these are the, the sites where we, we have currently uh, presence of Sonoita mud turtle and the condition how we think it is is one of them so basically in Kitabit is in the population is in good condition in Aguadulce Ridge uh, is still in good condition even we have we had that high mortality in 2019 in still in good condition Santo Domingo we we think that in this area they, they were extirpated because it's totally dry and uh, basically, the habitat is not suitable anymore for them. Uh, in the in the new Sewage Lagoon, uh, they they are still in high risk for, because the population that we had there before was just reduced drastically. Uh, but with the new uh, habitat that they have, uh, there is a, a good possibility that to recover this this population in the future. And in such a Milko Ridge near the Sonoita town, uh, there are there are also in high risk because the population the population there is very small. 
we have a very low norm in the habitat is not very very suitable and far far away from there in, in kitchen even when we haven't been uh, counting them or marking them uh, population looks to be in good shape um, those, those are good news for the for these subspecies. So future, we we're gonna try to keep up populations, especially the ones in our dulce, um, tracking individuals with telemetry to to study how the site fidelity and habitat use. Uh, continuing evaluating the new effluent, uh, the new site that they have near the Chihuahua Lagoon, and also serve, trying to survey the new the the Sochi Milko and the Quito back uh, sites where we haven't been able to to monitor, and also to continue the DNA analysis and compare the differences in between sites up trying to update the conservation plan for this for these subspecies so thank you so much for volunteers to all the people interested in in this uh, yet i think there is still a lot of things that, that we can do and there is still many people who can help and get involved in this effort to protect this beautiful uh, turtle. And well, I think that's, uh, that's it for now. I, I'm open for, um, thank you. Miguel, there was a question in the chat that I didn't have an answer for. Um, did you see any difference in movement distances between male and female turtles, or are their movement distances similar? Well, um, the one of the turtles that, that was moving a lot was uh, a female, but other females doing the same thing. Uh, so I don't know if it's about uh, uh, sex or it's just about that specific individual, which is, I think, uh, I guess we need more data to say that uh, females move more than males. But right now, I, I don't see a difference between females and males about moving. Probably uh, we may have a better answer in the future, but right now I don't see that difference. There are a lot of good questions in the chat box. It's like a little uh, session at the Turtle Survival Alliance. Um, are you, <laughs> have you uh, observed any winter rain activity? In the, in the- Yeah, actually, the, the, sorry. No, that, that's all. There's just a bit of a delay. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, we were thinking that they wouldn't be that active during the winter because, you know, it's the temperatures are lower. But actually, the, with the rains in, during the, the winter, we have usually more water flowing to the, the Sonoita River, and they are still active during the winter. I guess... It depends more on the water availability than in, in the temperatures. That, that's something that we need to test. But usually during the summer, when I will believe they, they are more active, we don't have that much water and they are not active during the summer. And during the winter, they are more active. That, that's very interesting to see how it, it's more about the amount of water they have and not about the the temperatures. Uh, John Iverson is asking, welcome John, uh, great to have you. Um, 
John Iverson is asking if the, the species has been bred in captivity. And I believe there's been at least one instance at the Desert Museum where they've successfully bred uh, and hatched. Um, so Paul Stone uh, studied, I believe it was Paul Stone who studied uh, Sonoran mud turtles in New Mexico. And, and he observed that um, anytime you disturbed an animal, it would, it would make a long distance movement away from the site of capture. And it seems like these Sonoida mud turtles are smart enough to stick around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's interesting that they just stay in the same place. They don't look to care much about that. And yeah, most of them just stay in the same place where we captured them the first time. And that's why once I put a transmitter, I don't mess with them again. Every time I, I, I see it, I, I don't try to to find them and, and, and grab them. I, I just mark the point and that's it, leave them, mess with them and disturb them. So. Do you have any idea um, how the pumping of the aquifer affected Keto Bakito? I know they recently halted border wall construction, but I'm wondering if, if the pumping is affected the rate of evaporation or pressure or anything associated with the spring. With Kito Bakito spring? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is we don't know. If you, if you talk to Tom Meixner or Hector Zamora, the hydrologists, you know, the, the idea of, of pumping from five or eight miles away, having an immediate impact on Kito Bakito is exceedingly unlikely. Um, it may be, multiple years and maybe a decade before that impact is actually felt at Kito Bakito. And that's, that's part of the trouble is that, you know, it got all the attention this summer because the water levels were critically low. Um, but the, the actual impact is, is much more likely to be felt years later when nobody's paying attention anymore and the border wall is not in the news. Um, they had stopped using that uh, well pretty recently but even before the, the, um, the stopping of the work order from Biden, um, because they had finished construction in that part of, you know, the construction they were doing was outside of Oregon Pipe. So it was just basically truck traffic going by in the last maybe two months. So I think, you know, if anything, I think the impact would have been exacerbating the, the leaks in the pond and causing the water levels to drop um, I think, unfortunately, we'll, we'll see the impacts of the hydrology later on for both, for both the Agua Dulce Reach and uh, Quito Bakito. There are a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, Dennis Doug, Doug, I was just going to say Doug had a great comment here that they even stuck around during the big flood. So you know, Miguel captures them, marks them with a file, does, you know, harasses them, they don't move. They don't move when it dries up. And then we had Hurricane Rosa where there's an enormous flood that scoured 100 meters wide across Agua Dulce, ripped out the entire riparian forest um, and the turtles, you know, moved 10 meters <laughs> during that time. So they really, <laughs> they don't move. <laughs> Uh, Dennis Caldwell makes a good point, and uh, you know, the, the turtles are easy to to reproduce, and and actually, there's it seems like there's a lot of captive Kito Bakito mud turtles, but the issue is finding a suitable habitat to put them in. That's the that's the big big question. Um, that's why we're optimistic about the effluent reach, because that's that's the only reasonable way to get more water on the landscape in the short term and we're not we're not going to do it we're not going to restore the aquifer in the next 50 years even um, so that's that's and then of course you know building more backup populations more places like the sonoran desert museum would be great 
Um, and then there's a great question in here about checking holes and caves next to the river between the roots of trees. So especially before the hurricane ripped out most of the tamarisk along the river channel, Miguel, most of the turtles that he would find would be tucked, especially in those dry seasons, tucked into excavations in the banks way under the roots of the trees. So they're definitely using that, that habitat that Eduardo asked about. Welcome, Eduardo. He's an up-and-coming turtle expert in Mexico. Um, I, uh, I think it's really interesting to note this sort of juxtaposition of uh, anthropogenic factors and, and what, we're, what we consider invasive species. I mean, we're, we're in a scenario where we actually welcome effluent water because it's the only permanent source of water. But um, on, you know, there's the red ear slider that occasionally gets into the, into the, the Quito Baquito, um, and that needs to be looked at. But what was really interesting is to note that you had an invasive tamarisk beetle uh, that could be affecting the invasive tamarisk, um, which would bring back or would make more room for native trees like mesquites and willows. And uh, it seems that the mud turtle eats mesquite pods. Is that incidental or is it, is it active? We, well, we don't know yet. I mean, we've, we've, we have a, you know, probably 12 turtles that we've been able to get good fecal samples and look at in detail. And we've got more that Miguel brought back last time. Um, but there are occasional turtles in seasons where it is 100% of the fecal matter is mesquite pods. Um, and then two months later, you'll go to the exact same spot and it's, you know, 80% algae and 20% aquatic insects. So I think there's a lot of variation depending on what's, what's available. Um, and, it, you know, another interesting note about the invasive species is that everything that's been kind of hard on the turtles and on the long fin dace has been wonderful for wiping out non-native species because uh, the Rio Sonoita uh, at one time had a pretty robust population of non-native catfish. Um, unfortunately, not the, the Yaki catfish that somebody asked about. Um, had non-native catfish, had mosquito fish, had um, uh, tilapia from time to time. And I think Doug can um, jump in if there's another non-native I'm missing. But the catfish uh, had disappeared by the time Miguel started working. So even though they were common in the early 2000s through 2012 or so, they were gone from the drought. Um, and then we watched over the last four years, we watched mosquito fish disappear from the site and um, the combination of drought and then the, the hurricane afterwards. Um, and now we, we don't, I don't think we've seen a mosquito fish in a year and a half, Miguel. It's all pupfish now because they're tough enough to deal with the floods and the droughts. Uh, were there ever yaki catfish? Someone asked in there. It's, okay. No, no, no native catfish. Although Doug says that uh, there were records of top minnow there. I've seen that, but I've been very doubtful of that. Doug, do you have a sense of if that's a, a reliable record? Because I, I saw that from, I think, a popular description in the 40s. Miller, Robert Rush Miller, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he would be reliable. Uh, Miles Traphagan says it's a different watershed at film. So, and Joe Plant says tamarisk beetles were deliberately introduced by UC Riverside agriculture research for tamarisk control. I didn't know that. Um, They've been deliberately introduced multiple times in multiple places. Uh, the the Sonoida population got there on their own. Uh, they had about a year and a half earlier, they had colonized the Yuma area and shown up in the Mexicali Valley. Um, so the beetle experts were pretty certain that's where they came from. We sent them beetles, so they're, they're doing the genetics on them, but they're pretty sure they, they hitched a ride on the, the um, frequent truck traffic from Mexicali and some of the Colorado. For the beetles after they eat all the tamarisk. Well, um, 
there aren't any more questions, I think this wraps up our presentation. Just under an hour and a half, way to go. Oh, one more message. Great. Well, um, if there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, stop the, the broadcast. Um, oh, Miguel's trying to get back in. <laughs> Miguel's arriving in time to say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's the trouble when you're stuck at home in, uh, in uh, isolation and your internet's not good. Yeah. Yeah. Miguel yeah. lives like five blocks from campus, but we don't want him to go there and potentially bring COVID to campus. No, no. I hope everyone's COVID safe and warm inside. Um, but, um, yeah, great, great presentation. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for showing up. I think it's um, something like 60 people, 48, but that's because people are leaving. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have this up on YouTube soon. <laughs>